Welcome to History of the Internet, presented by Tommy J from our moving studio on the highway. As you can look outside the windows, we are traveling at our cruising altitude at about 150 kilometers through the beautiful lands of the Czech Republic. Our first topic, something about the history of internet. J.C.R. Licklitter of MIT first proposed a global network of computers in 1962. Leonard Kleinrock of MIT and later UCLA developed the theory of packet switching, which was to form the basis of internet connections. Lawrence Roberts of MIT connected the Massachusetts computer with a California computer in 1965 over dial-up telephone lines. The internet, then known as ARPANET, was brought online in 1969 under a contract led by the renamed Advanced Research Project Agency, which initially connected four major computers at universities in the southwestern U.S. The early internet was used by computer experts, engineers, scientists, and librarians. There was nothing friendly about it. In 1986, the National Science Foundation funded NSFNet as a cross-country 56 kilobyte backbone for the internet. They maintained their sponsorship for nearly a decade, setting rules for its non-commercial government and research uses. In 1989, another significant event took place in the making the internets easier to use. Tim Berners-Lee and others at the European Laboratory for Particle Physics proposed a new protocol for information distribution. This protocol, which became the World Wide Web in 1991, was based on hypertext, a system of embedding links in text to link to other text. In 1991, the first really friendly interface of the internet was developed at the University of Minnesota. Delphi was the first national commercial online service to offer internet access to its subscribers. It opened up an email connection in July 1992 and full internet service in November 1992. All pretenses of limitations on commercial use disappeared in May 1995 when the National Science Foundation ended its sponsorship of the internet backbone and all traffic relied on commercial networks. AOL, Prodigy, and CompuServe came online. In 1998, the period of enormous growth, businesses entered the internet arena scrambled to find economic models that worked. Free services supported by advertising shifted some of the direct costs away from the customer, temporarily. Online sales gave growth rapidly for such products as books, music CDs, and computers, but the profit margins were slim when price comparisons were so easy. 56K modems and the providers who supported them spread widely for a while, but this was the low end now. 56K was not fast enough to carry multimedia, such as sound and video. This is when newer and faster technology emerged, such as cable modems and digital subscriber lines, DSL. In the past few years, newer and faster technologies became standards across the world, including wireless connections and fast mobile connections. Other formats have also emerged as people started to connect to the internet with their mobile phones, tablets, GPS devices, and many more. Now, did you know who the first user of the internet was? Charles Klein at UCLA sent the first packets on ARPANET as he tried to connect to Stanford Research Institute on October 29, 1969. The system crashed as he reached the G in login. Did you know? It is estimated that in 1993 the internet carried only 1% of the information flowing throughout two-way telecommunication. By 2000, this figure has grown to 51%, and by 2007, more than 97% of all telecommunication information was carried over the internet. How are messages sent over the internet? First, the message would start at the top of the protocol stack on your computer and work its way downward. Second, if the message to be sent is too long, 
Each stack layer of the message is broken up into smaller pieces of data. This is because data will be sent over the internet and has to be in manageable chunks. On the internet, these chunks are known as data packets. 3. The packets would go through the application layer and continue to the TCP layer. Each packet is assigned a port number because we need to know which program of the destination computer needs to receive the message because it would be listening on a specific port. 4. After going through the TCP layer, the packets proceed to the IP layer. This is where each packet receives its destination address. 5. Now that our message packets have a port number and an IP address, they are ready to be sent over the internet. The hardware layer takes care of turning our packet containing the alphabetic text or our message into electronic signals and transmitting them over phone lines. 6. On the other end of the phone line, your ISP has a direct connection to the internet. The ISP's router examines the destination address in each packet and determines where to send it. Often, the packet's next stop is another router. 7. Eventually, the packets reach the destination computer. Here, the packets start at the bottom of the destination's computer TCP IP stack and work upwards. 8. As the packets go upward through the stack, all routing data that the computer's stack added, such as IP address, port number, is stripped down from the packets. 9. When the data reaches the top of the stack, the packets have been reassembled into their original form. What components is the internet made out of? This diagram is meant to show a simple network structure. The internet is much more complex. The ISP maintains a pool of modems for their customers. This is managed by a form of computer, which controls data flow from the modem pool to a backbone. This setup may be referred to as a port server, as it serves access to the network. Billing and usage information is usually collected here as well. After your packets transverse the phone network onto your ISP's local equipment, they are routed onto the ISP's backbone or a backbone the ISP buys bandwidth from. From here the packets will usually journey through several routers and over several backbones, dedicated lines and other networks until they find their destination, the computer with the dedicated address. What happens between the time the user types in a domain in the browser and sees a complete web page? When you type in a URL into your web browser, this is what happens. First, if the URL contains a domain name, the browser first connects to a domain name server and retrieves the corresponding IP address from the web server. Second, the web browser connects to the web server and sends an HTTP request via a protocol stack for the desired web page. Third, the web server receives the request and checks for the desired page. If the page exists, the web server sends it. If it cannot find the requested page, it sends an HTTP 404 error message. You may all know this error message as page not found. Fourth, the web browser receives the page back and the connection is closed. 5. The browser then parses through the web page and looks for other page elements it needs to complete the web page. These usually include images, applets, etc. 6. For each element needed, the browser makes additional connections and HTTP requests to the server for each element. 7. When the browser has finished loading all images, applets, etc., the page will be completely loaded in the browser window. How does the domain name system work? DNS is a distributed database which keeps tracks of computer names and their corresponding IP addresses on the internet. Many computers connect to the internet host part of the DNS database and the software that allows others to access it. These computers are known as DNS servers. A DNS server only contains a subset of all the addresses and if one of these servers does not contain the domain name requested, it will redirect the requesting computer to another DNS server. 
what type of services are available on the internet? Nowadays, everything is available over the internet. From buying books or groceries, to checking your bank account, social networking, tracking planes or stocks in real time, to just plain old watching porn. Welcome to the second part of our educational video here from the car studio. I'm going to slowly finish off our video by one last question. Who owns or controls the internet? There are two answers to this question. Nobody and lots of people. If you think of the internet as a unified single unity, then no one owns it. There are organizations that determine the internet structure and how it works, but they don't have any ownership over the internet itself. No government can lay claim to owning the internet, nor can any company. The internet is like the telephone system. No one owns the whole thing. But from another point of view, thousands of people and organizations own the internet. The internet consists of lots of different bits and pieces, each of which has an owner. Some of these owners can control quality and level of access you have to the internet. They might not own the entire system, but they can impact your internet experience. I hope you enjoyed the history of the internet from our moving car studio, and we would like to thank our driver, Madskill, and we will see you next time on another educational YouTube video. Bye!